Where are we going today? I thought we would talk about NGC2, which is this guy just here. The little one, you may remember a little while ago, we talked about NGC1. Just in passing, I mentioned that NGC2 is actually, although it looks like it's sort of a companion, is nothing at all to do with NGC1 and is actually much further away. What's this people looking at on screen? Uh, here's another picture of NGC1 and NGC2, which doesn't look quite as nice as the one that I was showing you before. Um, that's because I took it from my back garden. Tell me how you took it. What's the process? Long exposure or how does it work? I think this was about probably about an hour. So it's only a little four and a half inch telescope, quite a small telescope. So you have to kind of point it at anything for quite a while to see much. You'd be pretty proud of your pictures, aren't you? I, I'm just amazed you can see anything at all from my back garden, to be honest. Your intuition might tell you that it's further away because it's smaller. But of course, not all galaxies are the same size. So it could actually be a small galaxy that's much closer to us. Or it could be, you know, a little bit smaller than NGC1 and at the same distance. So we need some other way of figuring out what the distances to galaxies are. There are two ways you can kind of figure out the distances to things. One is that we can just use the expansion of the universe. Because the universe is expanding, when a galaxy is further away, as the light comes towards us, the universe is expanding, which stretches out its light, which means that when it arrives at us, the wavelength has been stretched to a longer wavelength. So this is this phenomenon called redshift. The further a galaxy is away from us, the more the universe has expanded in the time it's taken the light to get from where it started out to where we are, and therefore the more redshifted it is. And so that's this thing called the Hubble law that says that the further a galaxy is away from you, the bigger the redshift you'll measure for it. So we've got the, the spectrum of the galaxy. It's got lots of these little absorption lines due to the various chemical elements that make up its stars. As a galaxy is redshifted, those little lines are all just shifted in wavelength towards the red end of the spectrum. So you just measure how much they've been shifted. You can think of it as a velocity if you like. It's how fast the galaxy is moving, but it also very directly tells you how far away it is. Sounds like problem solved. It does, and in fact, so here's the numbers for this galaxy. We can have a look. So what we got, we've got NGC2 is here, and here's the measurement of its redshift turned into a velocity, and it's like a bit over seven and a half thousand kilometers per second is how big its redshift is. You can turn it into a distance, and so actually if you turn it into a distance, you get a number, you get the number down here, which is 114 million parsecs away. And the relationship between those, those two numbers, the velocity and the distance, is this thing called the Hubble law, and the constant between them is this thing called Hubble's constant. And actually, you have to worry a little bit about other things. For example, the Earth's going around the Sun, the Sun's going around the galaxy, the galaxy's moving relative to space, or the cosmic microwave background, or whatever you want to measure it relative to. So those all add velocities as well. And so actually the numbers below are just various attempts to kind of correct for those effects, but they don't actually change things very much. You know, you turn from 7,500 to what, 7,200. It makes a little bit of a difference, but not a huge difference. So that was NGC2. Remember that's seven and a half thousand kilometers per second. Let's go back to the, the bigger galaxy, NGC1, and you do the same measurement, you get four and a half thousand kilometers per second. So smaller velocity means smaller distance. So as your intuition probably told you, that means that this galaxy is about 50% closer than this galaxy. Oh, loads closer. Uh, quite a lot closer, yeah. So that's one way of measuring the distances, but you have to worry a little bit about, you know, maybe there are other velocities going on, maybe there are other things that might be messing this up. And actually you also have to cal calibrate that relationship in that I sort of very glibly told you how you go from a velocity to a distance, which means you need that constant in between, the Hubble constant. And we need some way of actually calibrating what that Hubble constant actually is, which means we need other ways of measuring distances to things. There is a, a nice way of trying to measure the distances to these galaxies that's independent of the Hubble law and everything else, that's independent of everything. So it's a kind of a direct measurement of their distance. And that's a thing called the Tully-Fisher relation, um, named after the two astronomers, Tully and Fisher, who first came up with this idea in the 1970s, I guess. And the idea is, okay, you need some way of measuring some property of this galaxy that's kind of independent of its distance and comparing it to kind of the observed property. So the thing you might want to know is how intrinsically bright is this galaxy? Because if you knew how intrinsically bright it is, then from how bright it appears to be, that will tell you how far away it is. But the problem is different galaxies have different intrinsic brightnesses, so that's no good. Galaxies are not on their own, these things called standard candles, they're not all the same brightness, so you can't just say, oh, that one appears much fainter than that one, so it's much further away. But there is this indirect technique of saying, okay, so we can't measure the intrinsic brightness of the thing, but one thing we can measure is how fast the galaxy is rotating. And again, that actually just depends on the Doppler shift again. We measure the shifts in spectral lines and where you can see, so if you've got a nice inclined galaxy which is rotating, one side of it's going to be coming towards us, the other side's going to be going away from us. So we can measure the, the Doppler shifts within the galaxy and that tells us how fast it's rotating. And of course that doesn't depend on distance, right? If I took the same galaxy and moved it twice as far away and made the same measurement, I'd still measure the same speed of rotation. It's nothing to do, it would be a slightly harder measurement to make because it would be fainter, but it, you'd still get the same answer. 
And the reason why that's interesting is because effectively what that rate of rotation is telling you is what the mass of the galaxy is, in that if you have a more massive galaxy, it rotates faster. And so if you make a, a sort of a slight leap that says that the mass of a galaxy is in some way related to how luminous it is, how intrinsically bright it is, then that gives you a sort of distance independent way of measuring the intrinsic brightness of a galaxy. You measure how fast it's rotating, that tells you how much mass there is, you then say okay so for that much mass I expect this much luminosity in terms of stars and so therefore that's the intrinsic luminosity of the galaxy. And this really only works for spiral galaxies. They have sort of similar efficiencies of star formation and they form their stars at the same time and so on. If you make that measurement for spiral galaxies, you find that that rotation speed, which you usually get from the radio part of the spectrum, so measuring 21 centimeter line to see how, how much broadened the lines are, which is telling you how fast the galaxy is rotating. And you have to correct it for things. For example, if the galaxy is face on, then you actually you won't see any motion towards you or away from you because all the motion is in the plane of the sky. So you have to correct for its inclination and various things like that. When you go through all that process, you find that there is actually a quite a tight relationship, which means you really can go from how fast the galaxy is rotating to its intrinsic luminosity with a reasonable error, there's a little bit of uncertainty because there's some scatter in that relation. So then you know its intrinsic luminosity, you then go and look at how bright it appears to be, and putting those two things together then tells you its distance. So here's our, here's our two galaxies again. Let's start with NGC2. There's a bunch of measurements of its redshift we already talked about, but then there are these redshift independent distances. And so the one I was actually looking at was this figure from 2013, which is a relatively recent Tully Fisher measurement of the distance of this galaxy, and it comes out at 88 megaparsecs, so 88 million parsecs away. If we look at NGC1, the other galaxy, the one that we, from the Hubble relationship, was said was near, more nearby, the same Tully Fisher measurement, so this one's done in 2013, give an answer of 74 megaparsecs, 74 million parsecs away. We still have the answer that NGC2 is further away than NGC1, but actually it's not much, right? By this direct measurement, 74 versus, what do we have, 88, it's about 20%. Whereas if we you just use the Hubble law, we ended up with an answer which is about 50, 60% further away. You know, if you try and do this Tully Fisher method, you really shouldn't believe any individual measurement that much because the scatter in the relationship and so actually the luminosity you've kind of inferred for the galaxy is not that well tied down. So there's probably a fair amount of uncertainty which then translates into a fair amount of uncertainty in its distance. And so what would be a way of dealing with that? Well, supposing you made a measurements of a whole bunch of galaxies, then all those kind of random effects would all average out and so anything that's left over really would be a real difference in the distances between uh, the method you get from the expansion of the universe and the method you get from these sort of direct measures of distances to things. Let me refer to a paper, here we go, this, this is actually that 2013 paper that we were looking at before where those measurements came from and you can see actually that Tully and Fisher, the originators of this method, are authors on this paper so they're still very interested in, in the technique. But they've effectively measured for many, many thousands of galaxies the distances both from the expansion of the universe and from these more direct method, methods of actually measuring a distance. And if you make, if you subtract one from the other, that kind of tells you what the difference between them is. And so if you do that for a whole bunch of galaxies on the sky, and again, this is Tully's work. So the red ones are probably ones where the distance you get from the Hubble law is further away than the distance you get from these direct methods and blue ones, it's the other way around. And so if it was all just down to the fact that, well, you know, there's uncertainty in any individual measurement, then there'd be no patterns in this picture. It would just be kind of a random scattering of red and blue dots. But it clearly isn't a random scattering of red and blue dots. There's lots and lots of red over here and lots of blue over there, for example. And this is a, a manifestation of a phenomenon to do with the fact that the expansion of the universe isn't the only thing that contributes to the speed of the galaxies. And they have these things called peculiar velocities, which is just like each galaxy, as well as kind of respecting the overall expansion of the universe, is doing its own thing. So it might be orbiting a companion, it might be falling towards a cluster. Uh, so it, it has its own velocity. And there's no way of separating out, well, what's the velocity due to the expansion of the universe and what's the expansion due to these other things that are going on, except by doing this kind of thing. And so what they're actually seeing here, this huge effect over an enormous region of space, is a gravitational effect due to a, a thing called the Great Attractor. And the Great Attractor is this mass out there in space. If you think about what happens, everything's expanding, but the things on the near side of it, they're feeling the gravitational pull of that Great Attractor, and so they're falling towards it. So as well as the expansion of the universe, they're traveling a bit faster because they're being tugged towards it. Things on the far side, are also expanding with the universe, but they're being pulled back a bit by the Great Attractor. Like it's a handbrake. It's slowing them down, right? So it's, it's kind of dragging, trying to drag them back, trying to halt that expansion. And so this sort of systematic pattern where you see extra velocity in some places and less velocity in other places 
is a manifestation, a, a way of seeing that there are these huge concentrations of mass in the universe, which are kind of messing up that overall expansion of the universe by adding in extra, fairly large scale motions of galaxies. So what's the final decision? How do you finally decide how far away a galaxy is? You can't trust any individual measurement like from the Tully-Fisher relation that much because there's just uncertainty due to the relation and its calibration and all those kinds of things. Okay, so you can't trust that. You can't trust the, just the, the Hubble expansion of the universe because there are all these large scale flows and things going on. Once you've mapped out what those large scale flows are, you can actually correct for them in your measurements of the velocities of the galaxies. And once you've corrected for them, then potentially all that you're seeing then is the smooth expansion of the universe. And then you can use the Hubble law, having corrected for all these other effects to try and get a distance to it. Personally, I think probably it's a bit of a mugs game. I don't think anyone's ever going to really believe the absolute distance to any single galaxy because there are always going to be uncertainties associated with it. But fortunately, if you're looking for these kind of large scale effects, all those uncertainties in any individual galaxy kind of average out and you really can get a good picture of what's going on overall in the universe. Zodiac signs, because why would you want 13 zodiac signs and not a nice round 12 right, rather than 13? So if you were born between the 29th of November and the 18th of December, technically the sun was in Ophiuchus and not Sagittarius.